Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Unfound Podcast channel. Uh, today, I'm going to attempt to do a quick video, a quick diagram of the disappearance of Flight 370. Uh, it's no surprise, I don't think, that over three years since uh, we covered that disappearance in the summer of 2017 with Jeff Wise, uh, being the guest, that it is still uh, the number one most complex disappearance we've ever covered on the program, mainly because of the talk I had with Jeff about satellite pings and radar and a whole bunch of other issues that uh, have not come up on any other episode that we've done. Of course, Flight 370 is still unsolved all the year all these years later, and I wanted to just go through the generalities of it. I'm not going to be talking too much in depth about the satellite pings, although I will attempt to explain at least one point to all of you that uh, is important, I think, that you understand, and it certainly, I think, bolsters the idea, uh, the theory that Jeff Wise has regarding the flight, uh, the disappearance of Flight 370. So once again, not going to get in too in depth into it because it is very complex, but I just want to give you a general flight pattern of what it did that night and uh, where the searches have been done and where pieces that are believed to be from Flight 370 have ended, ended up and then show you uh, Jeff Wise's uh, theory. So what you're looking at now, as you can see on the screen, is Malaysia. I don't know if I ever thought that I'd be doing a video uh, about Malaysia for Unfounded, but here we are. And Flight 370 took off from Kuala Lumpur. It was headed up to Beijing, and Beijing is up in like that direction, in a northeast direction, way up there. going to be a uh, a decently long flight. Right here, you can see Ho Chi Minh, Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. And over here is Thailand. And then you can just see the very southern tip of, um, what is this? I don't look at this part of the Myan Myanmar, otherwise known, originally known as Burma, Myanmar. So Flight 370 took off from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, headed to Beijing, China. It got approximately into this area where Malaysian airspace ends and Vietnam airspace begins. So uh, air traffic controller would from Malaysia would hand off to an air traffic controller in Vietnam. Well, right after that happened, this flight did a huge U-turn came back down this way in what you would call a south East southeast direction, right back over uh, the border between Malaysia and Thailand. You may not realize this Thailand, but Thailand gets very skinny. Just to show you what I mean by that, um, you know, Thailand is up here, but most people don't realize it gets very skinny and reaches the whole way down here in, uh, to Malaysia. Burma also makes up a little part of that very, very skinny part of land. But the flight made a U-turn, came down here, splitting the difference, you might say, between Malaysia and Thailand airspace, went here into the Malacca Strait, then made a turn, what would be northwest, up in this direction. And this is when, as you remember Jeff Wise talking about certain communication devices on the plane were shut off, then turned back on. This all happened between this U-turn here and this point way out here going into what is the Andaman, Andaman Sea right here, and then to a large extent the Bay of Bengal, and then even to a larger extent the Indian Ocean. But it came up to about this point and, of course, if you followed Flight 370 and the search for it, once again, it's still unsolved, 
what most people believe is that the jet got to about right here, made another turn, huge turn, and went pretty much directly south, down into probably some of the most desolate part of the entire Earth, the southern Indian Ocean. There's no land out here, nothing. And so it came down in this direction, and so all these searches that have been done, that were done and have been done, there's nothing going on right at this second, but for a couple years, they focused in this area right out here, west of Australia. Australia took part in it, Malaysia took part of it, it was a joint effort, using a very sophisticated sonar going across the bottom of the Indian Ocean. I guess you would uh, say maybe like mowing the grass, like you get out there with your mower and keep making circles and doing little strips at a time of grass until it's all mowed. That's exactly what they do here. They go up and down and up and down or back and forth, back and forth into the area uh, that they thought had the highest probability of finding Flight 370. Now, the reason they picked this particular area is a lot of um, reasons. Once again, I don't want to get into too, uh, too technical a point here, but it's a combination of how much fuel was on the plane, these communications that were going, um, these what they call handshakes between the jet and the satellite that you know would be up here over the earth, back and forth, and they can figure out where the jet is during that time. I think the, 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 the satellite was more in this direction. It wasn't right over this area. So it's a combination of a lot of factors that caused them to look down in this area. On top of everything else, uh, being that the theory was that, that uh, probably the head pilot, the main pilot, um, might have been suicidal or something like that. It made most sense to them that he would fly down into this area where the jet might never be found. Makes a lot of sense. So once again, just to go over this with you again. Jet takes off from Kuala Lumpur, is going up this direction, makes a U-turn, comes across here, then makes another turn, goes up into here, and then allegedly goes down in a southern direction. And most people who are what you might call authorities on this uh, crash, or this disappearance, I should say, sorry, believe that the plane ended up in there, this area once again for a variety of reasons. However, Jeff Wise has a different theory. And... Uh, it's frankly a little more conspiratorial, and you know how I feel about conspiracies, but here's what I know. The best experts, uh, some of the best experts on the earth came to the conclusion that almost assuredly the jet would be found right in this area. That area has been searched, and there is nothing there. Nothing there. So... I think we must entertain the idea that maybe Jeff Wise, and Jeff Wise has been saying this almost since day one, and he is an aviation expert. You, um, If you watch uh, the show Air Disasters, uh, he's been on there being interviewed. He is um, an aviation authority. Nobody doubts that. And that's why it was so great to have him on the program. And he's written two books, uh, of which I have both on audio, to listen to, and I still listen to them once in a while, because you know how much I am into flight disappearances and plane crashes, etc. He's made a counter-argument given some of the things that he suspects. We have to remember that the plane was headed up, once again going down here, it was headed up in this direction. And he has said that, what if it didn't really turn? What if it kept going this direction. What if when the communications of the plane were turned off and then turned back on, that somebody was able to hack into that system in the electronics bay of that flight, uh, of that Boeing 777, 
because maybe people don't realize is that you can access the computers and all the electronics of a Boeing 777 from the passenger compartment. It's very rare on jets, but that is the situation. There's a little trap door right before you get to the cockpit door. It's, I'm guessing it's usually locked, but what if somebody could have climbed down in there and that person or people could take control of the jet away from the pilots in the cockpit, even though they have the controls, but all the electronics of everything that controls everything on a Boeing 777 is down underneath where you sit and somebody could have gotten access to that. And what if these pings that showed the jet going down in the south direction um, were actually false? And given that the jet was headed up in this direction, in northwest direction anyway, maybe that's the direction that the jet went. And Jeff has said that it would be possible for if a jet would just to kind of, once again, split the difference between India and Bangladesh. We have to remember these were where the Himalayas are. So uh, radar uh, pinging is going to be very difficult anyway. We have some countries that don't have a sophisticated and air defense warning system like the United States, uh, some other countries and other countries like that could have split the difference between all of these different countries, Nepal and India going the whole way up here. And Jeff's belief is that the jet could have landed in an airport that is right down here in this area of Kazakhstan. Now, you should also know that Jeff's overall theory is that the Russians could have had something to do with this, and this goes along with uh, the shoot-down of a Malaysian, another Malaysian 777 that happened, uh, was it a year later, that was actually shot down by um, Russian soldiers over the over Ukraine. So once again, to diagram this for you, uh, a lot of experts think, think that it went down into the southern uh, Indian Ocean. Once again, some of the most desolate part of the world. Whereas Jeff believes that the, the jet went up this way, that the pings were faked due to the communications being turned off and turned back on, and landed in an airport. And you can actually see that airport on older satellite videos if you were to do this and it should also be known that the leader of Kazakhstan I think even to this day is very friendly with Russia. Why would Russia Russia do this? Well this was around the same time that Russia went in and took uh, Crimea back from Ukraine uh, illegally. Um, was a They were allowed to do that and the hypothesis is that they had the ability to do this to kind of draw attention away from that going on. I'm not sure if I buy into that part of it, but um, what Jeff says about the, the technological side of Flight 370 makes sense to me. And once again, I've read everything there is to know about it. I've, lis I've listened to both of his books. I've read a lot of different uh, opinions on it, and his, his seems to make the most sense. And once again, he is the only person, at least authority, who continues to be correct that he didn't believe that the, the jet would be found down here in the southern Indian Ocean. Everybody else said it would be, but it wasn't. Now, let's not forget, though, that some parts that are allegedly of Flight 370, let me zoom out here a little bit, have been found over in this part of the uh, Indian Ocean on the eastern side of Africa, Madagascar. What, do we do, what are we to think of that? Well, first of all, you have to remember that there is one guy in particular who has seemed to have found an inordinate amount of these, these pieces compared to everybody else who has been looking for them. That uh, first is a bit suspicious. In addition, if you were to go to Jeff Wise's website, jeffwise.net, you will find extensive articles uh, about the analysis of those um, pieces from some some type of plane because these pieces do have living organisms on them that 
that um, live in the Indian Ocean, will latch on to solid objects and breed. And the conclusion that uh, Jeff has come to with the help, he's not, of course, a, a biology professor, but people who um, are experts in that is that the living organisms that have been found on these parts of a plant that have ended up in the area, in this area of the world, do not match up with pieces that would have drifted from this area where everybody believes, mostly everybody believes, the jet would have crashed. It just doesn't match up. It You could say possibly that these pieces of a jet were planted somewhere. Maybe somebody dumped them out here and they um, floated over there to the east side of Africa. It just doesn't seem that these organisms, the way they developed on these pieces, um, different pieces of some type of jet, show signs that they were in the Indian Ocean as long as it would have been taken to get from this area over to here. Up for you to decide upon on all of that, but like I said, this is um, one of the most, uh, this is the com most complex disappearance that we've ever covered on the program. Uh, the And it's the most watched video here already on YouTube, the original interview I did with Jeff. Um, I think before uh, Natasha redid all the videos with my permission, of course we lost a lot of views. They went back to zero in most cases, and that's fine. I think that, uh, I think that the Flight 370 video had over 100,000 views or something on it, some crazy uh, a number of views of that particular video. But what's interesting is when I did that uh, episode uh, in the summer of 2017, as far as from a download standpoint, was not that popular. Uh, I think that you, the audience, uh, prefer more, I guess, more personal stories. No, pro I have no problem with that. But for the public as a whole, for the world, um... Flight 370 has dwarfed all of the other downloads or views on YouTube on the Unfound Podcast channel. It's funny how that works. But um, do I believe that Flight 370 will eventually f be found? I do, because I don't think Jeff and other people are going to give up looking for it. Now, if it really did end up in Kazakhstan and landed there and these people were, I don't know, murdered or put in a jail and they're still there and it's all hush hush it's probably going to take some work to prove that but Jeff's theory uh, still is very viable in my mind and I continue to support him uh, given that uh, he's definitely in the minority with his views so there you go a uh, very rudimentary very general explanation for the disappearance of flight 370 hope you enjoyed it Thanks for watching.